Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Peter Cowley. I'm your chair for this session today. Just to make sure we're all in the right place. Uh, this is a workshop. We're going to discuss content portability. Um, know your rights. So hopefully most of you are aware that the uh, European Commission has put proposals forward to reform some of the copyright rules in this digital area era uh, that could possibly have an impact on how content is portable across the region. Consumers have new rights, but the businesses that deliver that content have a few things to think about. And we're going to explore some of those issues today. We've got a, the great and the good from the world of content and content portability. We're going to hear, first of all, from Duncan Callow, who's partner at DLA Piper, about knowing your rights. Uh, we've then got um, a rights holder. We've got the Premier League, William Bush, who's an exec director there, who's going to give us the view from the Premier League. Um, then uh, we've got Gregor Pollard, who's the Director General from the ACT, the Association of Commercial TV in Europe. Um, his perspective, which cuts across a few different areas. Then we've uh, got the platform provider, M Magin. Uh, Michael Turner, the Chief Content Officer, will give his perspective of the platform provider. Uh, we then have a panel that's going to form to hopefully ask some of your questions, so please save up, save up those questions for the end. Um, Duncan won't be joining us for the panel, but we do have David Johnson, the CEO of Contact, Compact Media, who's going to join us for that at the end. So please do uh, save up your most intelligent questions for that time as well. So. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to invite Duncan up to begin proceedings. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Peter. Um, well, this was originally uh, described as a fireside chat. I, I don't see the fire, and, but I hope there'll be some chat. Um, I'm a little cautious about that mechanism. The last time I, I attended a fireside chat style presentation, it was at our International Partners Weekend. And at great expense, we'd got Alan Greenspan, uh, former chairman of the Fed, along. Um, I think the English partners all hoped he'd talk about geopolitics. Uh, our US colleagues were probably looking for share tips for their portfolios. And in the end, he spent half an hour talking about himself. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push along and hopefully not repeat that problem. Um, I, I, I thought I'd set up some of the background to why we are where we are. Um, and forgive me if, for some of you, this is, this is, this is obvious stuff. Um, look, there are very good commercial, creative, linguistic um, reasons for why rights are sold on a, on, on a, on a national basis. Um, but fundamentally, underpinning all of that, it's because copyright is a national creature. It's a national right. And even when one is talking about news or sports where there may not necessarily be a specific copyright relating to that content, copyright is never far away from this area and therefore it's the relevant legal area that underpins all of this. Um, now, in the EU there's been various attempts at harmonisation to some degree and I've listed some of the uh, relevant directives that we've enjoyed implementing over the last 20 years. Um, perhaps the most important one there may be the satellite and cable directive that was the first to introduce a legal fiction, this idea that for the purposes of clearing copyright in a satellite broadcast, you pretended that the only relevant act was taking place in the country of, or original country of Uplink. And that was, that was the sort of first attempt to perhaps tweaking around the edges this idea of copyright as a national territorial right. Um, and yes, there's been debate from time to time in the, in the courts between copyright and competition law. Um, the tension between copyright on a national basis and competition law trying to encourage uh, trade uh, across the EU. Um, but the point I'd really like to stress to everybody in this room is that the main factor, I think, underpinning much of this discussion um, is what's currently called the digital single market uh, debate, which is being pushed through at the behest of Juncker at the moment, but it's something that frankly has been there for the last 20 years, which is an obsession for the Commission. And that's why is it that there are no 
European superpowers in the online world. Um, since the dot-com days right through to now, why is it that the players online are not from Europe, but from elsewhere? If you look at the top uh, 100 websites as we stand here today, if you take out the local versions of the US brands, um, there are no Europeans in there. Uh, the BBC might slip in at uh, 99. Uh, that is a major concern to the Commission, and it's underpinned uh, so much of what they've done in the last 20 years, whether it's consumer law, whether it's competition-based, whether it is uh, issues like uh, digital signatures. But it is also relevant to, to copyright and the issue of portability. Um, and, and in that context, the focus originally perhaps was around geo-blocking, which suddenly uh, arose on the agenda in the last... 18 months to two years, uh, and that um, set off alarm bells, made many of us worried that perhaps there was going to be a further attempt to erode the concept of territoriality. To a degree, the Commission has reigned back from that, Parliament has re European Parliament has reigned back from that, um, and perhaps content portability is a middle ground, a, a compromise, can be seen as a compromise, can be seen as a more limited step um, along that route. But um, let's have a look at what the, what the regulation actually says. Um, and now it's, it's a regulation. It's a proposal for a regulation. So unlike those other areas of law I mentioned, this will have direct effect. It won't require implementing at a, at a national level. It'll be the first attempt, in, in certainly in the area of copyright, to implement a, a, a change in the law in that, in that way. Now, um, it, it broadly applies to content services um, any content by any means. Uh, we, the, the, the regulation talks about whether it's by streaming, downloading, or um, a, a, any other technique. Um, but there are limits. It, it, it only applies to a, an online service if provided lawfully, on a portable basis in a member state, to a consumer who has a, agreed terms, has a contract to access and use the service in that member state of their habitual residence, a subscriber. And in return for money, or if no payment is made, where the subscriber's member state of habitual residence is verified by the provider. So those are the, those are the rules to decide whether or not the service falls in or out of this regulation. And if it does, there's then a positive obligation on the service provider to enable, is the word used, a subscriber to access and use the service when the subscriber is temporarily present in another member state, but without any obligation as to quality requirements that might apply in, in the home state. Now, there might be some debate about that. Um, the regulation says that that would still involve the same content, the same device, and the same functionality. Um, but you can see perhaps there's then a distinction between the, the, the quality levels um, that, 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 that deliver those. Um, and um, the key element from a legal perspective is that once again, there'll be a legal fiction. The, 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 the way to get around any contractual or copyright uh, arrangements which would otherwise prevent uh, this uh, access in another member state is that the law will deem the access and use to still take place in the subscriber's home state. Now, there's no, uh, there's no way that anybody can contract out. You won't be able to write into your contracts that you uh, will accept this legislation. Um, but rights holders can require a service provider to verify that the above is taking place, that there's, there's an and, and that there has to be an effective uh, means for verifying uh, the location, but uh, those have to be reasonable, only as, only as necessary for that purpose, and they have to comply with relevant privacy law. Um, and the timing, well, once the regulation comes into force, there'll be a six-month period uh, before it applies. And the Commission says it's going to review the situation both during that six months um, and after that. Um, they're pushing for a 2017 date. There's much talk about trying to bring it in at the same time in June 2017 as, as roaming charges uh, disappear. So that's, that's the timetable. Um, now, uh, there are many questions uh, about the regulation. I I'm hoping that my learned friends are going to answer those questions. Uh, I'm setting up some of them there. Um, many of them around definitions and, and, and I'm conscious that lawyers can spend a lot of time arguing about definitions. It's what we're taught to do. Um, uh, clearly, the concepts of whether something's verified, 
um, what's a habitual residence, the, the concept of temporary. I'll, I'll let my colleagues deal with those. Um, I, uh, I wanted to just get across, though, was a bigger picture, which is um, I'm sure there'll be a degree of argument. There'll be some discussion about these points. There may or may not be amendments made to the regulation. Um, but the two points I wanted to get across was, one, a question for everybody, which is how far do you, if you already have contractual provisions allowing for uh, forms of portability, um, how far do you try to second guess some of this and negotiate it in your agreements? Clearly, if you don't already have those provisions, uh, working out whether or not you start to do that regardless of uh, the questions that already exist. Um, and then perhaps a bigger picture, which is um, how far do we need to be cautious about the way in which this law is implemented uh, uh, and applied because, as I said at the beginning, is it, is it a halfway house? Is it the beginning of, 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 of changes to copyright and territorial, uh, territoriality generally? Um, when this was in, introduced in December, uh, the language used was that this was uh, the hors d'oeuvre uh, for what would be served up to us this year and beyond. Um, and I'll be interested to hear again from my colleagues um, as to whether they feel that this really will have a big impact, um, that it really will change the game, or is it no more than an updating of the roaming clauses we've had in our mobile contracts uh, for 10, 15 years? Um, I'm glad I've not got to answer that. So, um, Peter, do you have any questions? I do have some questions. Thank you for that. Um, just a few for clarity. I don't want to take away any of the answers your learned colleagues, uh, I like the phrase, um, are going to answer a bit later. But if you take someone like the BBC that is a free service in the UK but is currently blocked, uh, some of the content at least is blocked outside of the UK, your point about verification, I think, is quite interesting there. How, how you can defer this to someone else, but how could someone like the BBC deal with that under this regulation? How, or how they, I know they have to, but do you have any view? Well, I guess the, the lawyer's answer is three levels to that. One is, is it clear what contracts and agreed terms are? So um, we've been having great fun looking at various apps to, when you sign up to see whether as a lawyer looking at a uh, relevant case law from the Consumer Rights Directive, our own UK regulations, whether actually there is a contract, because you could argue as to whether or not you've then fallen within the regulation on that basis. Um, there's then the question of, of verified, and the guidance goes some way to say whether there's some form of uh, verification taking place. Um, but I would like to say that the guidance given um, uh, is sufficiently clear to decide whether in any particular situation there's been a verification or not. Um, uh, and then thirdly, the, the assumption of the regulation is that there should only be a requirement to comply with this if you're already verifying so that it keeps costs down. So, so the idea is that um, this is a piece of regulation that is not going to involve significant cost, and ultimately so that significant cost is not passed on to the consumer. Um, but if there's any doubt about whether or not one falls within it, the BBC, ITV, or whoever, then it's, 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 fa it's failing to deliver, uh, because the whole idea is that it should only apply to people who are already either charging or already um, re requiring the, the kind of verification procedures that would enable the regulation to work. My other question probably relates to the, your first slide that you said uh, we, we've gone from this world of geo-blocking to sort of protect those rights on a regional basis, not only in Europe but beyond. But you, th you said uh, that content portability was a compromise. And I, I wouldn't mind you just expanding on what you, what you mean by that in terms of why is that a compromise and what would be the full solution? Yes, so, so the starting point were comments from the relevant politicians who've been responsible for this uh, 
making comments along the lines of why should we not have access uh, to the BBC website in territories ar around Europe? And there's some very good reasons for that, on the basis that territories around Europe haven't paid mm -hmm. uh, for the licence fee in the, B in the BBC website. Um, and there was much discussion about the benefits of breaking down the barriers uh, and breaking down geo-blocking. And I think confusing geo-blocking in a consumer, in a... Um, uh, in, in a, in a, in a, a uh, general e-commerce sense from geo-blocking when it's being applied for legitimate reasons in the concept of, of, of territorial and right, territoriality and rights. And when much of that was explained to the relevant politicians, they needed to, re they needed to ro row back from that. Um, and to be fair to them, content portability, as I said, had been on the agenda and green papers in 2014, 2012, I think. Um, and then that was brought to the fore because... Um, that allows them to say that they are providing something to uh, consumers, which is demanded, and there's lots of, to be fair, in the 86-page impact <laughs> assessment report, which is there for you to read if you want to see it. There's plenty of uh, arguments to, to defend it, um, but, it's, but it's something that doesn't involve um, reining back the earlier law about how competition law, notwithstanding that territoriality, is protected under EU copyright. That's great. Thank you, Duncan. Um, Thank you for that. I'll let you sit down. I'm going to welcome up to the... Thank you. <clears throat> well, we've set the scene. We've got a number of questions there. I'm going to um, ask William Bush from Premier League to come up and talk to us about the Premier League's position. They've talked publicly about this in the press before, but we'll get the full inside scoop from William. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because um, the... The main challenge will be, there's four buttons on here, so uh, you'll have to excuse me while I fail with the first three um, uh, before I find the right one. Uh, yeah, that is me. Uh, in fact, um, I am the executive director at Premier League, but I'm also chair of uh, a trade association, trade group, the Alliance for Intellectual Properties. So some of the things that uh, uh, I'll say will be applicable to content industries more widely. The, the Alliance covers a wide range of... Um, uh, content producers and indeed uh, has people in the physical goods space as well, uh, sort of design, uh, designs and trademarks uh, as well as copyright. Um, and I, I could probably also speak for the Sports Rights Owners Coalition, which is a group of uh, the, the major sports, not just European, but uh, uh, we've got American and uh, uh, Australian and uh, other non-EU um, uh, sports involved. Um, and it's fair to say, uh, and moderate quite how cross I can get about some of the digital single market stuff. Um, we are slightly nervous. I think it might be a modest way of, of putting <laughs> our, um, our view. And um, uh, so I put this one up because we're introducing a new brand very shortly. So I thought um, uh, I'd just sneak it in because um, uh, I quite like it. Um, anyway, um, who, who are we? Well, we're, we're, we're simply... Um, Football competition, 380 matches, uh, our 20 clubs uh, are our shareholders. Three go down, only one champion. What could be simpler? Uh, nice, uh, straightforward um, uh, proposition. Um, but we are very much a broadcaster. Uh, uh, perhaps the, the star, or certainly one of the stars of this season, is Vardy. Uh, that, that's him celebrating one of his many goals. And so that's what we are, audiovisual entertainment. And we have reached the point where we are a, a broadcaster of scale. So the digital single market is of huge interest to us. We probably bring in something approaching a billion pounds a year to the UK economy from uh, beyond these shores. And um, it, it varies from rights round to rights round. And our European rights round isn't finished yet. But somewhere between a quarter and a third of, of, of that sum comes from Europe outside the, uh, outside the UK. That's the EEA number rather than just the EU number. So we are a broadcaster of scale. Um, uh, in fact, uh, while we regard our competition very much as the other major leagues, we would never say we're the, the um, best league in the world, but we are the most watched around the world. And because we're the most watched, we're the most traded, most valuable global uh, domestic sport domestic sports competition traded globally. So there are competitors, they're all very, very good uh, football propositions. 
Um, but we're very much part of the creative industries. And to give some idea of how big we are, in terms of program sales internationally, we're bigger than uh, all that lot put together. Uh, we earn more for the UK than uh, the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, 5, and the independent TV production sector in terms of programming, not formats and uh, uh, other areas of activity. Um, uh, you could argue that Britain invented the football format, but we didn't sell it to the world. It sort of went round um, with um, trade and military adventure and whatever. Perhaps we should have had the format rights for it, um, but that was <laughs> some time ago. Um, uh, so we're, we're a broadcaster of scale, and that means that you'd have thought we've reached the, the point where the British government, as far as the Premier League is concerned, and the rest of uh, British sport, Wimbledon and um, uh, rugby and uh, cricket and so on, but across Europe, huge sporting propositions, fantastically attractive to the European and the global market. So even if you don't like sport you'd have thought the policymakers would look at the economic value of what we do and say, you know what, it's worth having. The, the Premier League last year, uh, before our new rights deal for this summer kicks in, uh, generated something like £2.4 billion worth of tax revenues for the UK exchequer. And you would have thought at a point when they're cash strapped, £2.4 billion was um, uh, worth having a look at. So we're slightly worried at the cavalier nature at which both the Brussels policymakers and, to some extent, the UK ones, are looking at this without looking at the economic evidence. Um, what are our challenges as a creative industry? Well, like everyone else, uh, intellectual property really matters. It's the fundamental foundation of uh, what we earn. We are, of course, concerned about piracy, uh, inevitably, and that bumps into European territoriality because many of the things that we might do uh, around piracy have a territorial basis to them. So not only are there market reasons um, for being concerned about territoriality, but of course there are um, anti-piracy reasons too. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, football, you might have thought, was a bit of a universal language, but actually it turns out that whereas every bit a cultural industry as film or TV, soap opera, um, book publishing, whatever. So we sell into the um, uh, EEA member states on a consumer-driven, not producer-driven, it's not driven by us, it's not driven by the intermediary market. It's driven by consumers. We sell on a territorial basis. Because it turns out, um, uh, unsurprisingly, that while we have uh, a, a degree of prominence in the UK market, represented in, in the uh, audience figures and so on, but in Spain or in Germany, where there are absolutely excellent domestic football propositions, we're a niche offering. And so we, we are a niche service, uh, and we get a niche revenue from there. Um, but what it, territorial, territoriality allows us to do is to work with um, broadcasters, other distributors, who feel that they know their market. Why should we, or why should a pan-European operator think they understand Estonia, picking a nation completely at random, quite obviously, nothing to do with nationality of commissioners. Um, why, why should we understand the Estonian market better than an Estonian um, provider? We want Estonian Premier League fans to get the service for them that is conditioned by, driven by, selected by, produced by, locally, someone who understands that market. Not only is that better for the consumer, but for people new to market economics, and that sadly extends to a number of officials you bump into, uh, it turns out that's good for the consumer, is good for the producer as well. The, the more we deliver what the consumer wants, surprisingly to some, unsurprisingly to others, uh, we generate more revenues. Uh, it's the classic Adam Smith win-win, and uh, as Adam Smith is now about, I don't know, 350 years old, you'd have thought that general lesson would have, would have sunk in. Not necessarily the case. Um, if you ignore consumer preference, then you treat the market with contempt. They don't get what they want. Homogenized products in the cultural space do not go down very well. And so uh, a, a series of things happen if you get market change wrong. 
pause in general and say, of course, the Europe, Europe doesn't lead the world in much, doesn't lead in the huge uh, West Coast dominated uh, digital industries, but it does lead in content generation. So you would have thought a European policy, the, the policymakers who come to this issue with a European perspective would say, what are we good at? How do we make it better? Instead of which they seem to be saying, what are we not good at? So how can we weaken what we are good at to try and create space for uh, the, the things we're not so good at? Odd, in a way, because of course, those companies have immense first mover, um, first mover advantage. So the idea that you can create a space for European sprouts to spring up uh, uh, and flourish, again, is a slightly odd uh, uh, outcome. So uh, as Duncan indicated, we've got portability, which by the way, we're very much in favor of, just as we are very much in favor of the single market overall uh, in, in, in general terms. After all, why shouldn't we want to sell in an unfettered way across a market of that size? And why shouldn't we want, in fact, we massively benefit from the freedom of movement of labor, which means we can present ourselves to Europe and to the world as a meritocratic football competition where all that matters is how good you are and not your religion or your culture or your language, your, your, your ethnicity. Uh, that is a huge attraction to us. So we, we are big supporters of the single market. Um, but if portability, which is a reasonable concept, if I go on holiday to Scotland, I can take my SkyGo with me and I can watch football in, in Scotland. If I go a shorter distance to Brussels, why shouldn't I watch the same service that I've paid for? Perfectly reasonable. But if it drifts into cross-border access, and many advocates of change in Brussels see portability as merely a staging post or even a stalking horse for, for the move into cross-border access, uh, what will happen? Consumers won't be happy. We won't be able to offer price to the appropriate cultural demand in a particular market. We won't be able to do that. What will we do? There is a chance, a significant chance, that we will say, if the Estonian rights holder can sell in Latvia, in Poland, can sell uh, into, into the UK in an unfettered way, what we might say, uh, or the market might generate this, is whoever buys our UK rights then becomes the European provider, because that's where the bulk of our revenue comes from. Will they provide something that's culturally specific? Maybe not. Will they provide something at a price which will undermine their, their offer in the UK? Given the way markets work, I think that's unlikely. So what might happen? Uh, consumers will be less well served. Their prices may well go up. Our earnings uh, in, in Europe could fall. The UK economy would, would earn less. The tax revenues uh, would be less. One of the few industries where the UK leads the world would lose its ability to trade successfully. Uh, you get homogenized uh, offers and culturally uh, a, a, a failure. Um, our stadia, which are beautiful by and large, not all of them, but they are compared to what they were 30 years ago, they are marvelous. Investment in that and in training, uh, training facilities would fall. Our distributions to the grassroots game, our distributions to uh, lower league football, our distributions to we work with schools and all the rest of it, that would come under pressure. Um, so to get all that list of negatives would be a public policy triumph. You'd have to work really, really hard to get that string of negatives. But you could see how mismanaged that's where, where you would get to. So I'll make just a few um, uh, concluding remarks, which is actually uh, you can leave things to the market. Uh, we, the way we sell, we haven't finished our European round, but although we have 31 territorial offers contractually, it's only about 15, 16 companies will buy those, but they, they buy separately, so to me. They, they, they're not motivated to buy in a, in a cross-border way, so you can let the market work it out. And in 2014, we put uh, this sentence amongst others, um, making it clear to people coming to bid in our market that we would have this sort of portability provision in there, sort of uh, seeing the way the debate was going, but more than that, seeing what consumer behavior was doing. Gray markets, portable gray markets uh, uh, springing up. So the market can, can do this stuff. So I'll, I'll finish by saying portability is clearly an idea which uh, the industry should respond positively to. That's what consumers want. That's what we should always care about. But it is a small number of consumers and a very small proportion of the hours consumed. So we shouldn't exaggerate and we shouldn't let this very small tail, what is a really well-fed, really quite happy um, dog. <laughs>
Not all metaphors work perfectly. Um, um, but we do need, we do need uh, as Duncan said, we, we need some sensible rules about um, verification so that portability can work effectively. We could do with some declarations from uh, the Commission and from the Parliament that portability should be seen uh, to work, tested, and on the basis of the evidence that you get from how portable markets work, you look at the way in which consumer uh, needs are satisfied or not, then you move on, evidence-based, considering uh, the impact of change before you consider anything more dramatic. Uh, I think there does need to be some modernization of legal frameworks. I think the enforcement frameworks need to be looked at. It is uh, getting close to ridiculous that you, you issue a couple of million takedown notices uh, in the UK, uh, and then the exact same company that you've issued those notices to for the exact same completely obvious rights-based uh, piece of material, you then issue a couple of million in every other uh, state of the um, uh, uh, EEA. So we're not against change. We're in favor of innovation. We're in favor of meeting new consumer demands, of embracing new technology. We're in favor of satisfying the legitimate portability needs. But what we shouldn't have is a, um, almost a philosophical purpose, which is to create this thing called the, the uh, pan-European consumer, uh, create this drive towards this myth of the rival to Google, the rival to Amazon, the rival to, to Apple, which is a farcical, even in the 1970s, that kind of uh, mercantilist industrial policy intervention would be regarded as uh, uh, ridiculous. To, 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 to have that now, with all that we know about picking winners and finding that they're losers, uh, let the market serve the consumers, play to our strengths, deal with our weaknesses where, where we have them, uh, but do it in an evidence-based, sensible progression rather than a, 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 a sort of lemmings over the cliff rush. By the way, Clemming, lemmings don't do that. It was a Disney uh, invention from the 1950s. But again, stay with the metaphor. Uh, let's not go like lemmings over, uh, over the cliff. Let's do what lemmings actually do, which is operate sensibly and rationally. Uh, uh, and um, uh, the only thing they really worry about, actually, is um, kind of seabirds. Um, and the odd Arctic fox. And that's what we should do, worry about our natural competitors uh, and not worry about artificial cliff edges created for us only to be pushed over. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <clears throat> if you don't mind staying up there just for a couple of minutes, I'll ask the questions of you at the lectern. First of all, more of a statement. As a Spurs fan, I think Harry Kane should have been uh, uh, on your slide. <laughs> Vardy, I think, is over. Oh. Kane's the future. But uh, I don't think that's relevant to content portability particularly. Um, you, you talk about being heavily consumer-focused, uh, which is good, and I understand being able to market your product in the right way, in the right cultural way uh, to each territory. But how big an issue is content portability. If, if you've built this into your contracts already, you obviously identified it as a consumer need, but it, it, it does seem a tie, potentially a very tiny point in a, in a world of much bigger things that we should be focused on. How big an issue is content portability it's for you? It, it's not huge. In, in market terms, uh, it's not dramatic. But because there are workarounds uh, either in straightforward pirate markets um, uh, or through grey markets, it seemed to us, particularly after the um, pub landlady case, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but they're sort of the, in, in our circles, legendary, um, uh, long running um, case where. Um, uh, the, 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 the landlady, I think unkindly called um, David by some of the, pa uh, 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 the papers because I wanted to describe us and Sky as Goliath. Anyway, um, David was deemed to have won, but what she won was the, the, the right to watch um, Greek TV in her living room. She didn't win the right uh, to show uh, the Greek service of our matches uh, in the downstairs room, which was her, her pub. Um, so ever since then, we've, we've looked at what consumers actually want to do. And frankly, whether it's the south of France or the south of Spain and other areas where British ex expats go, uh, you can see the grey market in, in operation. So we wanted to, we wanted to follow consumers' behaviour um, and do it in a way which we believe is proportionate, proportionate to the size of the market and the size of the issue. 
cross-border access is a huge sledgehammer to crack what is a, a, a very small nut of a problem. And again, with reference, I think, to a recent Guardian article where the Premier League was uh, quoted, um, there's this sense that Duncan talked about of how long is temporary? Is it that you can watch Premier League football on your two-week holiday in south of France? Or is it if you've got uh, a job that takes you to Europe nine months of the year? Which is the right way? Which is the wrong way? What's your view on that? I think that there's... That there's our view, and then there's a kind of a, a, an industry, um, what's the word, collaborative view. I think distributors, I think, would find it very, very difficult if they had 15 content providers in their bundle which they're, which they're selling, each with a different um, definition of, uh, of temporary. You might be technically able to, to, to manage that with uh, geo-blocking and uh, other systems of um, you know, not, providing, not providing it. But I think consumers would go crackers if they could get uh, Coronation Street and East, uh, East Enders for nine months or even you know, 11 months and three weeks of the year, but could only get football for two weeks and could only get a movie for two days. So I think there needs to be an understanding about what, what temporary is. Our own view is, provided you can verify the subscriber, provided you can verify that they have legitimately bought at a, an actual proper UK address where the service is properly provided, uh, and, and paid for by them, then that kind of authentication is more important than, than temporary. And in many, many of these things, uh, I think we would have an Anglo-Saxon preference rather than a sort of Napoleonic preference of let markets work it out. If it appears to be an abuse, let uh, uh, court cases develop uh, or agreements before going to court uh, establish what is reasonable because I think reasonable is a, it's a bit like um, it's a bit, like, a bit like a mongrel. You know, you, it's hard to describe, but but you kind of know it when you see it. Um, and that is a very kind of Anglo-Saxon legal code way of uh, of approaching things. I know it's sort of tidy-minded uh, folk from much tidier uh, legal cultures than ours uh, might prefer something more precise. Well, thank you again, William. Will you come and join us for the panel? Maybe if you can sit at the end and we'll fill up coming this way. Next on the list is Gregor. Uh, if you can come up to the lectern. Gregor is from the ACT, the Association of Commercial TV in Europe. Hopefully you'll work the greens and the reds yeah, and the button. Um, I'm trying to set up in a correct manner. Here we are. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, let me just see. Yes, absolutely. The greens and the reds. There we go. Here we go. Um, okay. Well, bonjour tout le monde. Hello. Um, thank you for having us and for being able to share the ACT's view. Um, well, this discussion comes at a very opportune moment, really, because uh, for, for folks like us who spend quite a lot of time in Brussels uh, discussing the arcanes of how to make portability work, we've arrived at kind of a mid-stage, could I say, uh, because once the Commission has proposed um, the, this famous regulation on portability, it's now being examined by member states on the one hand and the parliament. And we know that on the member state side, we've had this week a um, set of compromise amendments come out, so it's interesting. We're having a real development at member state level, and we're seeing a lot of the comments that you've made will actually be put into this, as well as our own positions. And with the parliament being a little bit late, but now starting to kick into action. So that's very uh, positive for us, and also very good to know that it's actually a former broadcaster that will be dealing with the issue. So it's always good to know that you've got someone in the know that's looking at the files. Uh, so. Um, this presentation, as you can see, is, is very much a practical take uh, on the portability proposals. Um, as representing broadcasters, of course, we're very keen to show that portability can work and that the proposal should be, in a way, slightly modified to ensure that we cater to the issues that you've raised, Bill. Uh, Will, sorry. <laughs> going to manage. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, should be modified to ensure that it can happen with a maximum amount of legal certainty and level playing field. And, and really, these are the two objectives we're trying to get to. Legal certainty, level playing field. And that's really going to be a lot about what I'm talking about and how we can achieve that. So 
Before I jump into that, maybe it makes a bit of sense to tell you about the ACT. Well, the ACT is founded in 1989. Uh, we're essentially the voice of commercial broadcasting in Europe, and we make the case for the sector in Brussels. Uh, we represent the largest European players uh, and cover all European territories and beyond. Uh, and regarding portability, the positions you will hear me evoke uh, today uh, will cover as much the concerns of uh, free as pay and hybrid players, uh, whether they be operating national and transnational, fa uh, transnational fashion. So, what is portability about? So we've had an excellent explanation from DLA, I won't take too much time, uh, but it is quite important to actually set it out because uh, there's been a lot of confusion about what portability is and what it isn't. So clearly, first of all, it's important to understand, as you were saying, Duncan, that this is a regulation. So uh, there'll be no messing about a national level and we'll have a set of rules that will come into place once we've agreed those in Brussels. Secondly, it concerns only services where TV operators are in scope to the extent that they have a pay relationship or verify the residence of their users. I've simplified a little bit, but basically that's the crux. And thirdly, it's about letting subscribers have access to their online content services while um, uh, allowing residents from one country, sorry, to access, uh, sorry, as <laughs> having uh, subscribers access to their online content services while away from their habitual residence and temporarily traveling in the EU. So this kind of home plus approach uh, is not cross-border access. So essentially we're not talking about people being able, uh, a Swede being able to uh, basically sign up to a pay TV in Greece. This is not the issue here. It's, it's quite a, it's more a, um, you know, it, it's more using the rather smart concept uh, that Dungan brought up of the legal fiction to make sure access during intra-EU travel is possible to your home subscription. So it's basically saying you can have home away from home, uh, if, I, if I were to make it very simple. So what are our vision in terms of commercial broadcasters on portability? Uh, it's really, well, we really want to make sure we capture three different uh, dimensions. One is that, you know, the customer is king, and we want to make sure that we meet their expectations, of course. Uh, all, but also we want to make sure that you know, the AV system, ecosystem, which is quite fragile in certain respects, uh, needs to make sure that no backdoor practices are being put in place that would undermine innovation and investment. And thirdly, uh, the, a real important part is around the, the governance of how this portability is going to work, because we need to make sure that we have a robust system in place uh, just to ensure that unscrupulous users or media service providers wouldn't try to game it. Um, so. In terms of looking at the different uh, parts, um, you know, who is concerned? What needs clarification here? Well, it, from our perspective, basically, we've got three parties, right? We've got the subscribers, the media service providers ourselves, and the right holders, although we, we are partly right holders as well. Uh, but in, in essence, uh, we find ourselves sitting a little bit in the middle here, and therefore we want to make sure that we can effectively respond to the justified expectations of the subscribers and the right holders. And to do that, uh, we believe that at present, uh, we need six issues to be addressed in the current text, and that's really habitual residence, authentication, temporary presence, scope of application, level playing field, and workable trans and transition. So it sounds like a lot, but it's actually, uh, keep in mind, uh, this regulation is about two pages long if you actually look at the article, so it's not a great big regulation in, the, in essence. It sounds like a lot, but really we're, we're looking at, at marginal but very important changes to make sure that the legal certainty and the level playing field are achieved. So, on habitual residence. Um, well, this is a fundamental point uh, because it really underpins the legal fiction. Without a, a, a proper uh, definition of habitual residence, the legal fiction doesn't work in the way that it's supposed to. So uh, the issue that we have here is that if you look at the body of EU law, you don't have one definition of res habitual residence. You don't have two, you don't have three, you don't have four. You have over a dozen definitions of what habitual residence is. Uh, by the way, I'm not reading the slides, but they basically say the same thing that I'm saying. I'm just talking around them. But, uh, you know, um, so we need to have a much tighter um, definition of what that means. Uh, and, and there, uh, you know, for, for, the lake, uh, for the sake of legal certainty, certainty uh, we need on the one hand to make sure that, you know, 
this definition allows travelers, you know, whether, whether on business or in holiday in the EU to get portability. But on the other hand, we need to make sure that any, you know, lax criteria would not open the system to abuse. So for us, the answer here probably lies in a far uh, clearer definition of what habitual means. And we would probably go, uh, and we are advocating for, an, for a definition that ties it more to ordinary residence and to ensure that the concept of routinely returning is attached to habitual residence so that we make sure that we, we, we understand that this is not somebody who's going, as you were mentioning before, who's gone for several, several months. And it's not, he has a residence card, but he's not actually still a habitual resident in that sense. Um, Great, I've just lost my speech, sorry. Uh, so, we go back to authentication. So, authentication here is, um, you know, what, what is the main issue we have here? Well, at this stage, uh, really, uh, there's an issue about authentication. This probably should read authentication and verification. The, the distinction here is really between the means media service providers use to assess the subscriber at sign up, which we would describe as authentication, and thereafter. So this periodic verification to make sure that you know, there's no gaming of the system that's going on. And the point here is that for portability to work, all the players need to achieve an equal minimum acceptable basis for proper authentication and thereafter verification. So to achieve this, we need the regulation to impose verification on the basis of what is currently deemed to be the best means available. Essentially, that means for authentication, this can be a mix of different things, but you know, for example, credit card information, local bank account, installation of set-top box, um, and for verification, probably more uh, periodic IP address checks would work. But uh, fundamentally, uh, going back to the major point, uh, we need to have a, a very clear view uh, of uh, what would make authentication acceptable, particularly when portability will kick off. So to make sure everybody is, is, knows where the bar is and, and can meet that standard. On temporary presence, well, the EC has taken an interesting approach here by not really putting a number of days, but just by defining temporary presence by being outside of your habitual residence. So this, this approach is, is interesting, but it does kind of create a, a many uncertainties for, for us. And just like with habitual residence, we would ask, without putting a number of days forward, uh, that this concept take into account uh, the transitory nature of this presence, and also that it makes clear that this would apply for a short and limited amount of time. And we fear that without a narrow definition, there's a real risk of opening a door to legitimate cross-border access. On the scope of application. Um, well, the scope of application is, is, is important in this regulation, uh, and it, it would particularly be important to uh, free-to-air providers. I mean, the key issue here is to have a clear understanding as to what verified means and to ensure that media service providers are not caught between, on the one hand, a subscriber that believes that because he's given some basic information and he has a login right now to, to a free-to-air service, that he would deem this as being verified. And on the other hand, that we would have right holders that do not see the provision of such basic information as actually meeting the standard. So uh, the point here is that you know, free to air players should be protected in a sense from A, any litigation that could arise from, not, from having different interpretations, to very real disincentives to collect any basic information by fear of actually being caught in the scope. Uh, and that would mean that we lose you know, some very valid, valuable information in order to improve the service, or conversely, that we would push some free to airs to collect a lot more detailed information, and some would say more invasive information, such as bank card details, and which would probably deter a lot of people from signing up to the service in the first part. So uh, to ensure this doesn't happen, we really need to have verification to be explicitly tied to a number of reasonable verification criteria. And to, with that in mind, you know, IP address will not be sufficient uh, in order to address that issue. On the level playing field, well, the level playing field goes back again for this need to, for the regulation to have some form of enforcement, should I say, in it, uh, so that you know, we essentially uh, arrive at a, a level where we can ensure that all the media service providers 
that are applying portability are doing so in the same way. And we believe that in this sense, the right holders have a particular position that enables them uh, to ensure that there is more enforcement uh, and that the effective means of verification are in place and that they are applied. It's my penultimate slide, so sorry if I'm taking <laughs> a long time. But uh, on the transition period, uh, well, essentially the, the commission has put six months down. Um, from conversations with people in, in the broadcasting industry, uh, generally people will tell you for this kind of new service to be in, put in place it takes about a year or so. And it's not only about you know, any potential negotiations we would have with right holders, et cetera, but it is also about, well, how do you do the interface? How does, technically, how does it work technically? It's just not, as the commission likes to put it, reversing geoblocking. It's not that easy and it will have costs. So there's, there's clearly an issue there that six months is not enough. We're not saying we need a year, we're not saying we need two years, but we're saying six months is, is not enough. So here we go, the six criteria we need. Uh, it's very uh, legalistic in that way, but I hope <laughs> they make sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a couple of questions again for you. Um, with your, as a representative of the commercial broadcasters, if, um, is there anything in the regulation or anything that you've been discussing which either allows you or doesn't allow you to deliver advertising locally to where the person may be? So if I'm a UK, habitually in the UK, I'm traveling to France, can ITV, for example, deliver French-based advertising to me whilst I'm in France or, or not? Is there any clarity on the monetization of that content outside of any pay? It's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure that you know, the advertising point actually ties in with the portability point. Neither am I sure that ITV at this sense, and by no way is this an official declaration, I, yeah, but I'm if, not asking it, for yeah, yeah, no, ITV, but I'm just saying, no, generally, gen generally, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I do not see the link there between the provision of advertising, because you, you have to keep in mind that we are talking about a legal fiction. So yeah. the service would function as if you were back in the UK, right? So then the question is, do we want to, uh, in the infrastructure that we put for that service, if we know that people are abroad, do we want to serve them local French ads? I don't see anything in, apart from data protection things, et cetera, that, that may, you know, if it's over-intrusive, et cetera. But I don't see anything in the language of the regulation, to the best of my knowledge, that would stop you from doing more tailored advertising if that helped. I, yeah. I don't think that's what the regulation is no, about. No, and I, 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 I get that, and none of, nothing has yeah. even hinted at it one way or, other, or another. It seems naturally if you're a commercially minded broadcaster yeah, 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 and sure. enough people are traveling, you might look yeah. at doing much as BBC.com does yeah. that outside of the UK. I, yeah, I think the wider question that's interesting, if you look at it, is going to be about how will commercial broadcasters and if they will be able to monetize portability at some point. Yeah. And that's really, and these are interesting discussions that are going on. You know, we are hearing from people, for example, well, we need an amount, a limit of amount of days because like that, we can say, well, you can have more days with a premium offer, which I, I understand and I'm sympathetic to the agreement, especially because people say, well, that will then be the, the, the way that we ensure that the people who use portability are actually the ones paying for it. And that's, uh, you know, there's kind of like a social justice uh, yeah. argument there in terms of, because if you talk, if you really look, crunch down the numbers of how many people want portability, it's not huge, right? We're oscillating between three or 5% maybe. Uh, and so in, in, in that sense, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes interesting to figure out, well, for the 95% of others who won't be using it, but there will be a cost and somehow they will be affected, how do we make sure we find some monetization solutions for the broadcasters to make sure these people pay for that service? Great. Um, I also had a, a sort of verification question. Please. Uh, as a uh, third party looking in on this, I'm, I'm thinking of actually the Premier League and the BBC in particular here. So if I'm a big fan of Match of the Day, which has uh, Premier League content within it, and I'm 
currently the BBC doesn't force me through a verification or registration in the UK to watch the iPlayer. I may be going off piste here slightly, but bear with me. <laughs> I'm a skier, so I'm happy with <laughs> It that. doesn't need to be the Premier League. It sure, could sure, be sure. any other rights holder. And I'm going on holiday to France. If that broadcaster, it doesn't need to just be the BBC, does not have a registration authentication system beyond IP that you mentioned, what happens? Can they not implement content portability or uh, can they and then they're open to... Uh, being sued or by the rights holder? It, it may be a legal question, I don't <laughs> it's know. It's, uh, there's a scenario no, no, there. It's, I, I, I've, does the, 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 the question point, is, yeah. does the broadcaster have to have good enough authentication to allow content portability? And if they don't, are they going to be forced to do so by the European Commission? Well, it's not going to be the European Commission that's going to be doing. It's going to be the, the rights holder that's going to be doing the, the, the enforcement, in a sense. At least that's what we're advocating. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing it because, you know, there's anything um, against the right holders. We are right holders ourselves. So it's not that, that's not the point. The point is simply to say the bar should be here. Mm -hmm. And because if you have a VOD provider in Luxembourg that suddenly decides that, hey, I don't care about the rules. I'm just going to go ahead and do cross-border for everyone who says, I live in Luxembourg, tick the box, you know? And we don't want that to happen because we know how quickly that happens and how quickly people will forum shop in order to get that. And it will create cross-border. And that's what we don't want because we don't want to arrive at a situation where we kill the model, which is territorially based. And if we do that, then we, we can forget about all the nice content that comes. I mean, we're fully aligned on, on, on that point. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, Michael Turner's next up from Magin. If you could come up to the lectern. And Gregoire, if you can come and sit down. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you, Michael. I think we're going to get from you the platform provider's perspective on this whole debate. We are indeed. Bear with me. So unlike... Um, Unlike Alan Greenspan, this is actually about me. <laughs> um, 26 years ago, I, I moved to uh, Barcelona from, from the UK, and uh, a city which arguably has done more damage to the, the Premier League than any kind of uh, right, <laughs> rights leakage. <laughs> um, but I also have a, a personal stake in this, because uh, I, I I like television, I like the programs that are on it, I like the way it's financed and the way uh, the content is uh, uh, distributed. So um, any, kind of, any kind of portability affects not only uh, my position as a viewer in Barcelona, but also as a, uh, a lover of TV, uh, a good TV programming. And then in a professional capacity as a, as a rights negotiator, which is what I've been doing for for all my life, so, uh, well, the, the professional part. And, and when I've been uh, uh, trying to, to organize rights from an OTT perspective, um, I've, I've come across uh, a, a particular problem which could really be just encapsulated in, in something like this, um, you know, which is the original portable content. Uh, and when I, when, I, when I open this, I, I can go backwards in it. I can, I can start where I wish. I can decide to read it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I, I can even take it to Barcelona and it works, technically. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are issues which, when you're an OTT startup provider, as Magin is, uh, you have to tackle because people are treating you pretty suspiciously. Now, TV is on the move, perhaps. Uh, uh, we're all here trying to work out in which direction, uh, uh, and we will be next year. And. Uh, uh, I think what is in no doubt at all is that viewers are on the move. And, and since viewers are on the move, we, we have to adapt in some way to that uh, with, a, with a technological system, but with a rights framework that can, that can sustain the industry. It would be, uh, I, you know, I've been, I've been manhandled and, and pressured to, 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 to make some kind of corporate speak about what we do at Magin. Uh, I, I'm resisting that manfully on your behalf, uh, um, but I'm, uh, I, I have to explain a little bit about what we do because uh, without that context, 
uh, you probably won't understand why, why I'm here in, in such heavyweight company. Um, I, feel, I feel drowned and blessed in detail uh, from what I've heard in the last uh, hour. Um, but, but just to, to brief, I, I, I'm going to get through these slides in the next five minutes, so, so relax. But um, the, the, the business of Magin um, is based around uh, making agreements with the kind of companies you see listed there to distribute their, their television programming. This may seem like no mean, f uh, like, like a, a lighter enterprise to yourselves, but uh, um, when, you, when you have our background, and that is, I, I, I go to, let's say, the, the Premier League or, or to uh, uh, Sony Pictures, and you say, well, we're, a, we're an OTT provider, and, and of course, the, the first eyebrow is raised. Uh, and then you say that you are, uh, um, you're cloud-based and you want to record the programming in the cloud. And of course, at that point, the jaw drops completely, you know, and, 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 and fear is in the eyes. Uh, the third part, you say, is you're a TV distributor. Uh, and then there's a slight smile breaks out because they think you're rich. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not talking specifically about anybody who shares the, who shares the <laughs> panel with me, but, uh, but, uh, but this is the reaction we get. And, uh, the fourth one is we say, you know, we were founded in, in, in Sweden. We have, uh, we're a Swedish company. Of course, this is the last straw, you know, because uh, uh, <laughs> scant regard for intellectual property and the complete focus on daycare. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why did we do this? Well, one of the, the, the beauties of portable content is that I'm able to subscribe to The Guardian in, in Spain. And uh, Dustin Hoffman was speaking you know, quite, quite soulfully last week about the, 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 the terrifically sad position he finds himself in. Uh, and, and his description of, uh, um, of streaming was, uh, you, you know, what is it, that, that thing that's happening on television, um, that's where it's going, that streaming stuff, uh, we're all going to end that way. And he was talking about film, and I'm thinking, well, you know, uh, there's probably a greater risk to film by making Kung Fu Panda 4, than, than, uh, which Dustin has done, uh, than, than any of the rights that we're planning to control through an OTT streaming service. So all of this, this prejudice uh, is tricky for us to deal with when we think we have in our hands something which can distribute multi-territorially, very precisely, and in a very controlled fashion. But there is a threat, there is a threat, obviously, and we have to make sure that films like that and programs like that can be made in the future. And that means keeping the kind of structure in place that both of, or all three of my, my, my colleagues have spoken about. I need to put my glasses on, I'm sorry. It's just So how can, we, how can we extend that model? Uh, this is uh, uh, innovatively named the slide four because it, it reminds me that I want to talk about, the, um, about distribution and, and the four Ds that I call them. Uh, because everybody's after broader distribution and that's basically what portability is about. It's about broader distribution. Um, but um, what we're focusing is on, on traceable or trackable distribution. That is, you, you do know where your programming is being distributed. Uh, monetizable distribution. And above all, relevant distribution. Because if we just put a mountain of programming out there, this is what the, the internet was, was infamous for. Uh, was, was enormous choice and, and no, no criteria in that choice. So Magin works with the industry. And um, if you look at the television I, I've tried to represent graphically there, um, you'll all recognize the, the one on the bottom because I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, it, it's a, a very successful ITV production. Uh, everyone in Europe will probably get to see that and probably around the world uh, under the current rights licensing model. Uh, the one on the left is for a market in Germany where we are present uh, as a consumer, uh, a, a B2C brand, as a, as a distributor, like a cable company, but o OTT. 
and uh, that's a population of 90 million. Um, I, I doubt any of you will ever see that program. Uh, I doubt it will ever be, be, be shown here, and yet it, it brings in 35% audience shares. Um, the, the program on the top right is, is made by Catalan Public Television. Uh, it probably brings in about <clears throat> a couple of hundred thousand people. Um, very, very high quality production. Very, very popular. Uh, as sellable as, let's say, Happy Valley. But <coughs> incapable of finding distribution uh, under the current uh, distribution systems. But perfectly adaptable to an OTT distribution model. So where does OTT kick in in, in playing a role in, in, in portability and controlling it? Well, we, we think that the, where, we've, uh, where we've leapt ahead is in precise rights management uh, and also in the, in the concept of a kind of global highway for, for content. Uh, much of today's con, uh, discussion is, is centred around Europe, but I, I see no reason why, why we can't extend that to, to uh, portability uh, worldwide. Um, there is uh, a mountain of content which could be distributed and isn't. Uh, with production costs falling, you can, you can uh, put your content uh, at such a level of quality that it would be sellable anywhere. Uh, so we have to be, as operators, editors, and decide what goes out there and what reaches our customers. We have to have some, some idea of, of selectability or selection. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're just uh, filling the pipes with, uh, uh, let's forget the word and just assume there's a word that goes in there. <laughs> so we can measure whether people are watching by a, a catch-up functionality, a start-over functionality, uh, how long they're watching it for. Uh, we, can, we can see whether they're uh, watching it for the third or, or, or fourth time. Um, and we can see what device they're watching it on. Uh, and you'll notice that that's very much a book reading habit. Uh, everybody's taking it where they wish and watching it where they wish. And we can measure those people. Um, but of course, we can also find out if they throw the device in the river after your program. So this is valuable <laughs> data. <laughs> because in essence, the viewer wants it all. And uh, uh, we have to have some control over that as, as operators. We, viewers would like to be in films. In fact, reality TV is just an extension of what viewers want. Uh, they want to be on television, but there has to be some control over that. Uh, I recognize that we're, we're running over, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and wind up now. Um, the EC is, is working on this. Um, but the force behind that, the driving force behind that is to contain piracy. OTT can play such a vital role in that. There's, there's only two real hurdles, which are, are defining temporality. Uh, in my own case, 26 years has, has, has apparently exceeded what, what the EC have in mind, um, which is a tragedy for, for me, but not for my children, who claim to be able to get around this by a, a, a selection of internet tricks, which I haven't acquired yet and wouldn't be able to professionally, of course. Um, and then the other, the other thing we can do with OTT is we can, we can precisely state where people are. Uh, this is something which is very difficult with any other operating system. Uh, and if the EC wanted to, to, to really promote a, a, an audiovisual industry that was strong and that could compete with the, the, the west coast of the US, as has been mentioned today, then simply financing adequate subtitling or making the Europe a hub for content uh, around the world would be the, would be the way through. Um, Variety is important, we believe in that. We don't want to fill the pipes with, uh, uh, um, we, can, we can technically distribute two and a half men to any house in the world, if anybody thinks that would help. <laughs> um, we, we prefer not to, we think that we can detect what viewers like watching, we can feed them content from whatever level of production, from whatever country, to where they're, they're, they are at that moment and where they would like to watch it. Um, that is actually a more sound model economically uh, if you feed, let's say, uh, two and a half men to, to, to a family, then four of them will leave the living room and watch something else on their other device in another room. 
If you can provide the programming that the other four watch as well, TV viewing rises, and uh, both culturally and economically, that is a sounder model. So to summarize, you know, we, we, we can do everything technically with OTT. We, we offer uh, a B2C product and a white label solution uh, uh, with our technology around the world. Uh, the, uh, that technology gives us partners in countries all around the world. We can feed content into that, those partners through our, our highway of, uh, uh, of delivery. And that means that although the global blockbusters get everywhere under the current system of distribution, then the local gems can also get to the people who want the local gems. And there's really no way of doing that uh, without an OTT structure in place because that's the only cost-effective way of being of micro-targeting programming in, in the world that's, that's coming upon us. Uh, because if there's one thing that haunts us, it's uh, uh, Dorothy Gambrell's description of the internet, you know, which you've probably all heard, but the idea of, of a, a drunken librarian who never shuts up. Uh, this is something uh, uh, you know, we lose sleep over because we're in a, in a distribution system that, that could do that, but in our case is determined not to. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, just before we begin the panel session, um, where we're going to be joined by David Johnson, I have a couple of questions for ah. you if you stay up at the panel. Um, as the last hurdle to get to the consumer as the platform provider, uh, it seems to me the burden of content portability from a technical point of view may fall to, to you guys. And what I mean by that is, is there a cost of adapting your verification systems to meet the needs of content portability, or, or do you have that functionality already in place? From the first day we started, uh, five years ago on a, a, an island in the Swedish archipelago, we've had to plough millions into technology to satisfy every single rights requirement that we've come across. Uh, and and if, you, if you've been involved in that process, then you know what I mean. And it, it is tremendously complex. Uh, we've probably put close to 100 million euros into that, that development already. We're not going to stop now because we believe that, that portability is something that, that has a model which OTT was, was born for. Uh, and so, yeah. so you may well be a leader against other providers of that content. My second question goes back to the con contractual rights. Mm. The rights that you've negotiated uh, with broadcasters and programme providers, do, they all, do any of them take into account content portability already <coughs> Or are you going to have to renegotiate every contract as this regulation comes? There, there, there's tiny exceptions, but uh, in the vast majority of cases, it's uh, extremely strictly controlled, and, and uh, we, we would have to go back and, and, and do most of that, which is the crying shame of this, because in a in, in a, a TV market which is is producing so much content now of such a high quality. Um, and I mean that, uh, you know, living abroad, you do tend to, to, to see what, what I certainly missed when I was very, uh, very British-centric in my, in my viewing. Uh, and I think that uh, I, that content will, will get out there uh, when OTT can show that it is a legitimizing force in this. and It is a way of regulating all this and confining it to, to where, when and how it should be consumed. Great, thank you. If you can come and sit down. And uh, David, if you could come and join us. Uh, we've got about uh, 12 minutes uh, till lunch, so I suspect we don't want to delay your lunch. Does anyone have any questions of the panellists? If you can save up your question, I'm going to ask David uh, one thing before we get going, so please do save up. Um, to the organisers, I forgot to ask, are we needing mics or... Yep, we have, uh, we have mics, great. So when you ask your question, wait for the mic and if you could say who you are and where you're from to help the panellists. So, one quick question, David. Um, first of all, could you introduce yourself? And secondly, um, Duncan at the beginning outlined a couple of questions that he felt were open. And I'm just going to ask you... Two of those, if I want okay. to introduce yourself, if you have a view on them. So um, the first bit, bit is really how big an issue you think consumer portability is.
from the consumer point of view. And secondly, uh, we talked, we've talked a couple of times about this temporary access and whether you have a view in your business, how long temporary should be. So. Okay, um, so uh, I run a company called Compact Media. Uh, I first came across Compact uh, when I was working at ITV and um, about 15 years ago, I appointed Compact to uh, manage the collection of our secondary rights. Um, a very quick explanation of what secondary rights are is something like cable and satellite retransmission of your content. So if you sell a primary license to a broadcaster like ZDF, and it will then appear on about 12 different cable networks, there is a royalty generated, and we help um, content owners collect those royalties. Um, so in terms of the two questions, um, I'm, I'm so pleased you saved those up for me. Yeah, um, uh, my pleasure. <laughs> I, I, I think the, um, the, the feedback we get from our clients, which are uh, primarily the rights holders, uh, is that there, there is some demand for portability, but that it's not massive. Um, you know, we, we believe that people that are living, for example, in the south of France or the south of um, Spain, uh, if they're UK residents, generally speaking, they have found a way to get hold of their UK channels through satellite anyway. Um, and everybody knows that it happens. It's not a major problem. It's not a major breach of, of those rights because the content's being paid for. Um, and, you know, I think the role of, of companies like mine who advise rights holders is, is actually to advise them the best ways of uh, making their content legally available so that they can get remunerated for it. Um, and then, can you just remind the, the second, second question? What, how long is temporary? How long is temporary? Um, again, I, th I think that that is a, a potentially could be a really big problem of, of definition. Um, and potentially, I think the cost of enforcing uh, an artificial definition of temporary might outweigh the benefits. Um, you know, it, clearly if somebody's away on business for a few days or if they're on holiday for a couple of weeks, I think most people would agree that that's temporary. Um, if somebody's living 10 months a year somewhere else, does that really matter? Uh, um, I think the, the primary thing is, again, if they've paid for the content um, and they're getting it from a, a properly remunerated and legal source, then that would be our preference rather than encouraging uh, either pirate or um, potentially grey market solutions. Great. Thank you very much. Does anyone have a question? Maybe a hand up. Don't be shy. Uh, we've got a lady here. The mic's just coming to you. If you could say who you are and where you're from. Yeah. Um, Sarah Tuckman, Rights Negotiation Limited. Um, I deal with um, rights distribution um, contracts. Um, I just had a question really about the extent of the regulation. Um, first of all, um, I noticed that Duncan was saying it in terms of the right to access and view a service. So I had a question of whether it would extend to DTO and uh, EST. And also I wondered whether in fact there may be a loophole for um, free television in the sense that uh, they don't per se have any subscribers. Um, so they wouldn't actually be forced, presumably under the regulation, to provide access on a temporary basis to um, their subscribers in, in another EEA um, territory. Thank you. So a few questions there. Anyone feel qualified to answer any of those? Yeah, I'll be able to take the second part about okay. the free TV uh, exemption since uh, um, the same rights apply that the fact that free TV is financed in a different way doesn't actually affect the, 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 the money that has to go back to the, to the rights owner. You know, I, I, I can't see how an exemption would, would work there, although the subscriber isn't paying. Uh, is, was, that, was that the essence well, of your... I don't see how that would work in practice because 
it seems to me from what Duncan was saying is that the essence of the regulation is that someone who's licensed, the platform that has licensed the content, um, if, they, if they provide portable services, and I'm not quite sure what that means, but what they, what they have to do under the regulation, this is what I understand, is they have to give their subscribers temporary access, right, if they're in another EEA state. Okay, so. Okay, yeah. that's the essence of it, mm. isn't it? Um, so I'm just thinking that free, te free television, for example, the BBC, they're a licensee of the content, okay? But they haven't actually got subscribers to their website. So what I'm wondering is, is that at that stage, is it the ISP that would come in and that would have to provide access just to viewers? I mean, how is it going to work okay, so. where you've got um, a platform, a free television platform, that actually doesn't have any subscribers, but where the authentication of the, of the person who is getting access is actually down to the ISP, because it's through my ISP that I am getting access to the BBC website. Okay? And then... It's not a direct relationship, whereas with pay, you've got the actual subscriber who's subscribing to the services of that platform. Okay. Do you, do you want to go uh, I, I think, just to go back to the wording of the text, but what the text says is essentially, listen, are you verifying that this person is a habitual resident, basically? And, and is the, are you satisfied that they are a habitual resident? If you have verified that, then you fall into the scope. Now, the real question for us is, what is verified? Right? So is it going to be an IP check? In which case, what you were talking about ISPs is relevant. We don't think that's enough, because obviously a lot of people are gaming IP via VPNs, etc. So the, the, the issue there is about making sure that the right criteria are there. But for the purposes of today, I would say, and I'm, I don't live in the UK, so sorry, I haven't signed up to the BBC yet, uh, but if I imagine that you go on the BBC and say, do a Facebook connect, or if you were to say, simply, listen, this is my address, this is my, uh, this is my uh, email, um, well, that wouldn't meet the standard of verified. That would just be you logged in to that service, and there is no obligation thereafter for them to provide portability. Yeah, Mo the point yeah. is, that only applies to Portability to your subscribers. Yeah. So the BBC doesn't have subscribers to their websites. E essentially, where this is going right now is that pay TV <coughs> will be the scope, and free to air will have an option if you want to simplify it. We'll have an option to Can provide it? portability. So there'll be a difference, in fact, between. Yes, because one will have verified by the fact that they have paying customers and therefore they know, right, that there's a payment. They know that they have a, they, they have a local presence, etc. So that verification has been done. And on the other hand, you won't have an ability to verify or people will not want to verify, will not want to impose that verification and therefore will be out of scope. We've got uh, another question down at the front here. Uh, Bill Gash at CSG. Um, for those who don't know the company, we provide, amongst other things, um, authentication solutions to broadcasters, for example, that allow them to ensure entitled users, they could be paying customers um, or just reg registered customers, access to their uh, entitled content across different devices and members of their household. I want to just float an idea which, this is sounding a little bit like ultraviolet, and I just want to ask first, anybody knows in the room what ultraviolet is? Good, band. good, a few people. So it's an open eco ecosystem for digital entertainment. It's very much being championed by the studios, of course, who want to encourage people to continue to buy and own entertainment. But actually, if you look at that service in Europe today, it is quite possible for me to um, look at my entitlements in the UK and provided the rights have been approved, and that's obviously the key part, travel to France, access my locker and stream and access my entitlements in another country. So while I'm very interested in this discussion, I just wonder whether a precedent already exists that a lot of companies and technology businesses and rights owners have already brought into that could, could actually be extended on a wider scale. 
Thank you. Does anyone have a comment on in terms of that? Well, just to a, to a general point, I think the capacity of um, innovation and markets to, to interact, to provide answers, is something that the Commission in particular needs to accept. It's much, much better for ideas like that to, to be generated than for them to be over-prescriptive and try and drive practice down uh, a particular conduit that they happen to feel intellectually comfortable with, but which ignores uh, a, a wide range of potential options. I think we'd echo that. It just for, for us, the point being to say, listen, I think even though there's a small demand, right, uh, that we, we can make this work and we can show that, you know, the industry is proactive and can do this in, in a workable fashion. Uh, where we would echo exactly what you've said is we would say, fair enough for Home Plus, but uh, don't come with cross-border requests following up on that because that would be hugely detrimental and yeah. it would, again, you know, satisfy very few people and damage the industry incredibly. Great. I think uh, we've reached lunchtime. It's one o'clock by my watch. Uh, it would be great if you could thank our panellists. Uh, and yeah. I was just going to say that's including Duncan from DLA. So uh, thank you for Duncan, Bill, Gregoire, Michael, and David who joined us at the end. Sorry we couldn't have longer for questions, but enjoy your lunch. Thank you for coming.